Okay, welcome back to the fourth and final part of the Gleon Student Association workshop on science communication. So we are going to dive right back into uh, exploring five additional samples, this time from the scientific literature. So I'm presenting here sample number six. Please go ahead and take a minute and read the text and assign its scores according to each of the three criteria that we're focusing on today. So those criteria are the CCC rating, the one thing rating, and the shared language rating. After you've scored a sample, uh, please discuss your, your ratings uh, with a partner or with a group. Uh, if you have one available to you, if not, uh, you can proceed to the next section where I interpret uh, each sample. So please go ahead and give yourself time to score the sample and pause the video now while you do so. Hey, this sample was published in Nature in 1881. So this sample has a context contradiction conclusion structure. It might have been a little bit harder to find than in the previous samples uh, because it doesn't have those obvious cues like the words uh, but, however, or therefore. Um, but just remember that we don't necessarily need those words. Uh, and sometimes those words can merely be implied by the surrounding text. So I would argue that this sample is relatively easy to summarize in 10 words or less. So my summary would be that squirrels adapt to aquatic landscapes by overcoming their aversion to water. And the text does have some rare and very rare words. So for instance, one could replace the word locality with area uh, to get across a similar meaning. One could replace navigators with travelers or replace peculiarity with strange habit or strange behavior. But even though the language was sometimes uncommon, uh, it is a part of the writer's style in this case. And the style of the writing in science is really reflective of the time when it was published. And when this was published, it was a time when Virtually everyone reading it was a native English speaker, so had fewer barriers to understanding a flowery language like this. Um, and it was also at a time when simply the pace of life was much slower, and it would be more acceptable for a reader reading a scientific paper in 1880 to take more time and look up words that they didn't know in a dictionary. Um, but Unfortunately, this style of writing uh, simply would be very out of place in uh, publication in, in the fast paced world of, of science today. And this sample really reflects that long term trend in science publication readability that I showed in the first part of the workshop. And some of us might actually miss this style of scientific writing, uh, but it really does uh, not really belong in the kind of modern international scientific publications that we see today, uh, for better or for worse, depending on your opinion. Now, please take a minute and read the next sample. This is sample number seven and assign it scores according to those three criteria. So to give yourself time to score this sample, Please pause the video now. So this is the abstract from a paper that was published uh, called On the Phosphorus Limitation Paradigm for Lakes. It was published in 2008. So in the context contradiction conclusion framework, uh, this sample has a whole lot of the first two, context and contradiction, uh, but it doesn't have conclusion. And you'll notice the repeated use of words like but, contradict, instead, and however. So maybe this is already uh, jogging your memory of the narrative spectrum. 
Um, so if you remember from the narrative spectrum, this is what we would call despite however yet style of, of writing. And it can be very confusing, especially for non-experts. But uh, here is a problem. So depending on your personal expertise, which maybe some of you are experts in nutrient limitation in lakes, you might have actually read this sample and had no trouble understanding it at all. Um, maybe you even gave the passage a good uh, context contradiction conclusion score. So our own expertise can sometimes cloud our ability to detect that kind of optimal uh, storytelling structure um, uh, in others' writing, but also when we're experts in our own writing, it, we can uh, struggle to uh, really hit that uh, optimal storytelling structure in our own writing as well. Um, so from one expert to another expert, any one of these styles, either AAA, ABT, or DHY uh, along this narrative spectrum, any one of those styles might be enough to get a message across. Uh, but the ABT structure, that CC or CCC structure, as I call it, um, is really going to give you the best chance of uh, ensuring that non-experts um, uh, can understand the, the content, even when the, the, the details of the content might not be that interesting to them. So I really struggled to summarize this sample uh, into 10 words or less, but if I had to, I would say uh, that you could summarize it as you know, different source resources are limiting over uh, different scales. And the sample is also loaded with uh, rare or very rare words. So a word like oligotrophic could be replaced with nutrient poor. Uh, but sometimes it's not really a matter of finding a suitable replacement for a rare word uh, so much as just dropping uh, those uh, rare words altogether with as long as you don't lose the main message of the text. So for instance, uh, biogeochemical theory could just be replaced by the word theory without too much loss in, in meaning. Uh, in the same vein, you could take uh, the phrase one might logically expect and replace the or, and drop the word logically. So it just reads one might expect. Now, overall, this sample uh, is kind of very typical of scientific writing in general. And, and I tend to find this style of writing uh, problematic across all three of these uh, metrics of, of good communication. So please take a minute and read the next sample. This is sample number eight, according to the, and then score it on your scorecard according to those three criteria that we're focusing on today. So give yourself time to score the sample by pausing the video right now. So this sample is adapted from a publication in 1965 called Predation, Body Size, and Composition of Plankton, and it was published in, in Science. So, and this example is given by the journal Linology and Oceanography Letters as an ideal significance statement. So if you're not familiar with what a significance statement is, it's just a sh basically a short version of a paper abstract that is meant for a broader audience. And it does a great job of following the context contradiction conclusion uh, framework by design. It even, it even states uh, on the Lamalgi and Oceanography Letters website that this is the structure that they're going for, uh, for or that they look for in, in uh, significant statements. And if I were to summarize it in 10 words or less, it would be selective feeding by fish reduces the size of zooplankton. So it's pretty readily uh, summarized uh, in that way. And so I would give it a, a good one thing score. But the text does contain uh, rare uh, and very rare words, some of which are replaceable or droppable. So perhaps you could replace large bodied with simply large, uh, or replace the word absent with missing, the more common word missing. 
Um, you could drop the word observed from the observed patterns phrase. Uh, you could also drop the word mechanistic from the phrase mechanistic explanation without too much loss of meaning for a non-expert reader. But some of these words are really not easily replaceable or droppable from the text. So for instance, the word zooplankton would be very difficult to state in a single simpler word. So the vocabulary in this passage really reflects a combination of both necessary and unnecessary rare words. But overall, this passage had a good context contradiction conclusion. It was easily summarized as one thing. Uh, but there might have been some work left to do to make it more accessible for a broader audience. So now we're on to sample number nine. Uh, please take a minute, read the text, assign its scores, and to give yourself time to do so, pause the video right now. This sample comes from a paper published in 2011 in PLOS One, and it's called A Global Analysis of Population Distance to Freshwater Bodies. And in this sample, they have a series of two context contradiction conclusion uh, statements. So they, and they stack uh, one on top of the other in this abstract. Uh, and and they, they have done this quite effectively in my opinion. So, Abstracts, actually in particular, when they're allowed to be longer, like this one was, really lend themselves to this sort of stacked uh, CCC structure. So you have one context contradiction conclusion that gives that context an interesting contradiction and then uh, that goes against that context. And then finally, a conclusion like, therefore, we analyzed X, Y, Z. And then in the second context contradiction conclusion, it's focused on the results and basically states that we found X, but we also found Y, which contradicted it, therefore Z. Um, so these, uh, a, a long abstract like this where you can fit in two CCs are perfectly welcome. And this passage is a bit longer and more difficult to summarize, but with a bit of thought, I would say that this sample is about how, despite social changes, most people still live close to water. And the sample actually has relatively few rare words. So the few rare words are often not easily replaced uh, and show up repeatedly, like the word fresh water, for instance. Uh, but perhaps that one very rare word, distributions, uh, could have been deleted altogether. Now, overall, this is a very effective example of science communication. I would argue that it's probably the best of the science samples uh, that we've looked at so far. And that is also reflected in how well this paper has been received. So uh, it's one of the most well-cited articles published in PLUS One about aquatic science. And it was mentioned in several news outlets. It's been blogged about. Uh, three policy sources have used this publication. And it's uh, been tweeted by 113 people and has received some attention on, on Facebook as well. So that kind of uh, attention, although it's not the only metric of the quality of, of communication, at least gives you a sense that, that they're doing something right uh, in this sample. So now on to the 10th and final sample. We're almost there, everyone. Uh, so please take a minute and again, read this uh, sample, score it. Uh, and to give yourself time to do so, pause the video right now. So sorry, I gave you a bit of a challenging one to get through in, the, in this last sample. So this is published in Nature uh, in an article titled Spliceosomal Disruption of the Non-Canonical BAF Complex in Cancer. And it was published in 2019. Uh, and yes, yeah, very challenging <laughs> to read uh, for us uh, non-experts. Non but I would say that the passage follows the context contradiction conclusion framework uh, pretty well. 
And there is something unusual about its context contradiction conclusion, though, and that is that the context is very brief, the contradiction is also very brief, and they spend a lot of time on the conclusion. Now that's okay as long as you have a really good context and a really good contradiction, because if you have that good uh, CC, you can maintain readers' interest for a long conclusion. But if your context and contradiction don't land with the audience, then the long conclusion will not be earned and the audience will almost certainly lose that interest. Uh, but aside from its CCC, it was very hard for me to identify the one message from the sample. And that kind of brings up this important point that these three criteria are really related in many ways. Um, so just like in the phosphorus paradigm sample that I showed earlier, where the despite however yet structure made it difficult to identify a one thing, in this case, all of that unshared language makes it really hard for me to identify the one message that the authors are trying to get across. So these three criteria are rather interrelated and, and the performance of a sample in one criteria can affect its performance in the others. And obviously the sample was full of rare and very rare words, some of which are readily replaceable and some which aren't. So for instance, this acronym that they repeat, uh, SF3B1, uh, another acronym, mRNA, the word malignancies, the word exon, these are all very rare terms which are not easily replaced by a, you know, a single uh, word that's simpler. Uh, but there are also some terms which you could replace with a simpler word. So for instance, the word aberrant uh, could be replaced by not normal or the word induces could be replaced by the words bring about. And almost all of the scientific samples that I provided do have some level of rare and uh, very rare words that were easily replaced with some more common words without sacrificing that overall message of the text. Um, and this sample certainly is no exception to that. And that does it. That completes the 10 uh, samples that we will be scoring today. Uh, but when I ask you to copy the sample scorecard, you may remember uh, that I mentioned a line at the bottom for a bonus sample. So what is that bonus sample? The bonus sample is what you wrote at the very beginning of the workshop when I asked you to introduce your work to someone you just met at Gleon in three to five sentences. So um, look across your desk or wherever you stored that uh, passage that you wrote and go back and score it just like you did for uh, these other 10 samples according to those three criteria. And to give yourself time to score your own writing sample, uh, pause the video now. So I hope that you were able to see some improvements in those three to five sentences that you wrote in the beginning and the ones that you wrote now. Um, and at the upcoming Leon meeting, I really encourage you to use this revised version to introduce yourself. Uh, you know, I see how, and really I encourage you to explore how people respond, see how well they remember what you told them later in the meeting. And I really bet that you will notice a difference. So today's workshop, we learned about three ways to improve our science communication. Tell a story, focus on one thing, and use shared language. But if you're still struggling to understand or implement these three principles, that's okay. So one workshop cannot make you into an excellent communicator alone. It really takes persistence to fully learn these skills. And so I encourage you to set up a weekly literature discussion group where you discuss these three principles um, over a paper that has recently been published in your field. 
And you can also dig in and learn more uh, by checking out one of the resources that I'm about to recommend here at the very end of this workshop. So two articles that I'd recommend that you check out uh, are, the first is published in 2017 in PLUS Computational Biology. It's called 10 Simple Rules for Structuring Papers. And the second uh, was published in 2020 uh, in Linology and Oceanography Letters, and it's called Simple Rules for Concise Scientific Writing. And I also have uh, several book recommendations. Uh, the first is Joshua Schmel's Writing Science. Uh, I think that one gives you the best kind of broad overview, uh, specifically in the context of writing. And it's definitely one of the, the main staples in science communication coursework that you might get uh, at, your, at your home university or institute. And then the next three books are each one for one of the uh, uh, guidelines that I have mentioned today. So for the how to tell a story, if you're really struggling with that one, I would recommend the book Houston, We Have a Narrative uh, by Randy Olson. If you're struggling with the one thing, uh, then I'd recommend this book called The One Thing. Uh, this, and the subtitle is the, Surprising Simply, the Surprisingly Simple Truth Behind Extraordinary Results. And if you're struggling with the uh, shared language, I'd really recommend this book. It's a funny read um, by Alan Alda called If I Understood You, Would I Have This Look on My Face? And the last book that I'll recommend is Science Research Writing for Non-Native Speakers of English. Uh, if, if there are any of you out there uh, in the audience who are um, non-native English speakers, that can be a nice uh, place to start when you're uh, learning about how to communicate effectively. So I want to give you a big thanks for your attention uh, and a special thanks to the Glion Student Association, to Lisa Bore, and to uh, Kati Patonai for coordinating these workshops. So thanks again for, for uh, paying attention and sticking it through. I know it's uh, not easy and, and you made it all the way through to the end. So congratulations and enjoy the Glion meeting. <laughs>